So this evening we are joined by two men from the um, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, Dave Niels and Steve Landry. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Just a few housekeeping things. Everyone will be on mute and have your cameras off for the recording. And um, as I just mentioned, this will be recorded. You can check it out after the fact. During the presentation, you can submit questions to our experts in the chat box. You will find um, either at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, this little icon here, and you can uh, type in a question. Uh, we will try our best to answer them if we know the answers, but if we don't, we'll save them for the end of the presentation for the question and answer period. Tomorrow you will receive an evaluation form from us, just asking for your feedback, how things went, what you think could have been done better. If you have any suggestions for future ideas of webinars, we love to hear that because um, we want to be providing webinars that people want to tune into and listen to. So please fill that out. Just a quick little update on New Hampshire Lakes, if you aren't already familiar with us. Uh, we're the only publicly supported nonprofit organization and, um, new, working for all of New Hampshire's 1,000 lakes. You can support us um, today by going to newhampshirelakes.org. Your support uh, does help provide webinar series like this one tonight. It's our mission to help keep all of New Hampshire's lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. We work with partners, promote clean water policies and responsible use and inspire the public to care for our lakes. And we do that through our programs. Uh, we have our advocacy program, which give our lakes a voice at the state house. And that is where we do the work um, for clean water policies and the responsible use for our lake. We have our conservation program. Uh, many people are familiar with our lake host program where we're teaching boaters to clean, drain and dry their boats um, as they come in to the lake and out of the lake, looking for aquatic invasive species. We also have our Lake Smart program, which is a program that people and businesses can do right at their own properties. Um, we teach people things that they can do to help protect the lake, like reducing runoff, um, all of those kinds of things. And that is free and voluntary. And even if you don't live on the lakefront, you can fill that survey out right on our website. It's quick and easy. I just did one for my own home the other day and you get an immediate response from us telling you about things that you could do to improve how lake smart you are. Our other program is our outreach program. Um, that program brings uh, different types of outreach to you, similar to the webinar series. And we are really hoping, fingers crossed, that we're going to be having our in-person um, Lakes Congress this year in the, or well, I should say next year, 2022 in the spring. I also want to give a quick shout out to Pony Automotive Group. Um, they're the sponsor for the Explore Lakes with New Hampshire Lakes webinar series. They've been a longtime supporter of ours. We're very grateful for their support. And I personally think they're a great company to work with. I bought my last vehicle through them. They make it quick and easy. So if you're thinking about buying a new vehicle anytime soon, I strongly recommend um, looking into Pony. Your host this evening will be me, myself, Erin Mastine, the Outreach Program Coordinator, and Michelle Davis is joining us as well, helping me man the chat box while we have the pre presentation going on. She's our Advocacy Program Manager. Thanks for joining us tonight, Michelle. And your two experts, Dave Niels, he's the Chief Aquatic Biologist at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and Steve Landry, who is the Supervisor of the Watershed Management Bureau, also at New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and get on to the main event here. And I will turn it over to you, Dave. I believe you said you were going first. Yep, just give me a sec here. And... No pressure tonight, Dave. We just got labeled as experts, so raise the bar here. <laughs> I know, not at all. Crushing responsibility. And people see my screen. Almost. Screen That's... sharing is paused, it says.
Ah, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks to Aaron for having Steve and I here tonight, uh, a topic that is near and dear to both of our hearts. Um, I will cover some of the science behind salt in our water bodies in New Hampshire. And then I'm going to turn it over to Steve after about 15 slides or so, and he's going to talk more about management. So um, as Aaron said, I'm the chief aquatic biologist at New Hampshire DES. I've been working at DES for a little over 20 years now, and I've been in this position for about eight. Uh, before that, I ran the biomonitoring program, ran around and caught fish and bugs and developed a bunch of uh, indices of biotic integrity for our streams. So a little bit about me. So just a quick outline of uh, things we're gonna cover tonight. And again, we're gonna do this kind of in a science meet management type of way. I'll give it an overview of salt use as a de-icer and its risk to aquatic life. I'll talk about some uh, data we have about the status of salt in our surface waters relate that to uh, how climate change might uh, impact the use of salt around the state. And then I'm going to turn it over to Steve. He'll give a little more detailed information about how salt is used around New Hampshire. And then a long, we'll say a long, but a, a more detailed overview of the green snow pro program and commercial applicator certification. So that's a little bit of preview of where we're going. So one thing I was asked uh, when we were talked about uh, giving this presentation tonight was a little bit about the history of salt used as a de-icing compound. And uh, I, I didn't know this, but salt was first uh, used in New Hampshire. Was, we were the first state in the nation to pilot salt as a way to uh, manage snow on our roads. And it was uh, started in 1938. Today, ap approximately 20 tons of salt is applied on our roads around the United States annually. So obviously, very popular. And here's just a quick plot showing the growth of salt. Uh, this is in thousands of tons uh, over time. So you can see how quickly the use of salt has uh, increased around the United States. And today, like I said, it's just about 20,000 tons that we use every year. So that's a lot of salt that gets spread on our roads annually. Well, how does salt work? It's pretty simple. As you know, when uh, salt dissolves in water, it lowers the freezing point of water. And once that brine is formed, that's really the, the magic elixir that allows us or allows salt to, to be such a great um, compound used to prevent ice buildup on our roads. So it's, it's relatively simple and we won't go into the detailed chemistry of things, but uh, that's kind of how it works. This is very interesting. I, I didn't know this, but uh, as the temperature of the air or of the road decreases, the effectiveness of our salt uh, actually decreases. So here's this little table over here on the left shows the pounds of ice melted per pound of salt. So you can see here at 30 degrees, the amount of uh, ice is melted for every pound of salt that's applied to the road is much higher than it is at a lower temperature. And you can see this here over on the plot on the right as well. It's the temperature on the x-axis and the uh, amount of salt that's, or amount of uh, ice that's melted per pound of salt on the, on the y-axis. And that's why uh, when it gets really cold outside, doesn't really, as you go out and spread ice or, or salt around your, um, your walkway or you see the effectiveness of, of salt on the roads, it just isn't very effective. So we'll come, we'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about climate change. But that's something to keep in mind. So most people know the salt is a simple compound. It's sodium and chloride for the most part uh, that's applied on our roads. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that these are very conservative ions. They're just charged elements and they never go away. Um, and they're also very soluble in water. So they never go away means they, they don't disappear. They don't evaporate. Um, they, they're, they're just hang around forever. And that's particularly important for chloride. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And uh, as we talked about, it, uh, salt dissociates 
uh, sodium and chloride dissociates when it's in water and it dissolves. So that makes it a, a very, uh, I guess, good pollutant in that way, in the sense that it's, it's able to, uh, to become part of our, our surface waters very quickly and easily. Um, we do have surface water criteria for chloride in the state of New Hampshire. We have a chronic chloride concentration that's 860 milligrams per liter. That's a four day average. Uh, we also have, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's the acute criteria. We also have a chronic criteria that's over a four day period. And that's the one that we uh, most commonly see or bump up against. And that's 230 milligrams per liter. We also have secondary uh, drinking water criteria for chloride, and that's 250 milligrams per liter. That's really just the taste uh, criteria. Your, your salt will start, or your water will start, start tasting salty when, uh, when the chloride concentration gets that high. Sodium also have a secondary drinking water criteria of 250 milligrams per liter and 20 milligrams per liter for people that are on a low salt diet. diet. When we're talking about um, problems with salt in our water. We're really talking about chloride, that chloride ion, um, not so much sodium, although that can be a problem as well, but we're going to focus on chloride tonight. So why is chloride and salt or why is salt such a problem in water? Well, there's this word we have in biology, uh, osmoregulation. It basically talks about the balance of water inside and outside organisms and also sort of indirectly ion balance. Um, and if you think of a fish very uh, simply here, they are uh, really salty on the inside compared to the fresh water anyways. So they tend to uh, absorb a lot of water because that's what osmoregulation does. It likes to go from a, from a uh, source of, of um, of lower concentration of ions to uh, a higher concentration of ions. Uh, conversely, because it's salty inside, the ions also like to go outside. So fish, freshwater fish anyways, they take in a lot of water and because, it, because of that, they actually uh, produce a lot of urine. So over time, fish have built up this physiology and cell membranes and processes within these cell membranes that are meant to function with a hypotonic solution on the outside, that means lower salt solution, and a hypertonic solution on the inside of the cells, that means high salt solution. So when you start adding lots and lots of salt to the water, these natural processes, physiological processes, either that happen um, indirectly or by some um, by some process that requires energy, they, they don't function. So that's why salt becomes problematic when it gets to be too high in our uh, water, in our surface waters. In general, <clears throat> invertebrates are much more sensitive than vertebrates. So invertebrates meaning things like um, uh, macroinvertebrates, like insects that live in our waters uh, as compared to fish. So the other invertebrate that we also see in our lakes a lot are um, zooplankton. So they tend to be affected by lower salt concentrations, lower uh, concentrations of chloride than fish do. The other interesting thing to, to point out here is that chloride here over on the y-axis is very closely related to another common measurement, an easy measurement in in water and that specific conductance and that's on the x-axis here. And this is just a plot of all the data that we've collected around the state where we have both uh, specific conductance of chloride. And you can see that there's a very direct relationship. So much so that we can actually predict the concentration of chloride in many cases just by measuring, measuring specific conductance. And this is really important because specific conductance is a really easy water quality measure to take. So any relatively inexpensive probe can measure specific conductance. And with that, we typically know 
uh, what the chloride concentration is. And in general, once a specific conductance gets above about 835 milligrams per liter, that means we exceed that chronic criteria for chloride, which is 230 milligrams per liter. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because a lot of times we don't measure chloride, we measure specific conductance. We have a lot more of that data lying around than chloride concentration. So I thought I'd take just a few minutes and give everybody a, a quick overview of what specific conductance concentrations will look like in our lakes around the state of New Hampshire. So this plot looks really confusing, but it's really simple to understand. This is just a, uh, a line that depicts the measure of all of our specific conductance concentrations. And if you think of the line being up here, that means it's the specific conductance is really high. So this would be a thousand microsiemens per centimeter. And we have very few water bodies that are up on that high. Down here, uh, this is very low specific conductance concentration. And these are for our eutrophic lakes. So if you know uh, about lake biology, eutrophic lakes are our most productive lakes. Um, we have several, we have quite a few of those around the state of New Hampshire, but they're probably not as common as some of other lake types. The median specific conductance for eutrophic lakes in the state of New Hampshire is about 74. So remember, we talked about 860 or so being that point at which it would exceed the chloride concentration. So here's the same exact plot, but this time we're talking about for medium level productive lakes, media, mesotrophic lakes, and our median there is about 50. So as you go down on this productivity scale, the, the uh, specific conductance around in these water bodies tend to go down as well. And then oligotrophic, those are the crystal clear waters in the state of New Hampshire, um, the least productive and the median specific conductance in those waters is about 40 or 41. So again, uh, we're in this range of about 41 to 70 and that anything over 100 microsiemens per centimeter, that means that that is in the upper 60th to 90th percentile. So that means that either 40 uh, or 60, yeah, 40 or 10% or of the lakes are, are higher than that. So. so we spent a lot of time looking at this data. We actually have a, a whole bunch of specific conductance data around the state of New Hampshire, both for our, our lakes and for our rivers. This is based on our uh, volunteer lake assessment program, which there's probably some of you that are listening here tonight that participate in that, and thank you very much. We looked at the trends of specific conductance in 150 VLAP lakes. And what we found was actually quite surprising. Of those, we had 62 that there was a significant increase over, uh, over the time period that we looked at. So that was pretty surprising to us. That's about 40% of our lakes, a little over 40% of our lakes have increasing trends in specific conductance as compared to only 8% that have decreasing trends in specific conductance. We kind of knew that that was probably the case, but it takes one of these uh, sort of larger analyses really to bear out those, those suspicions that we have. We also use some of the same data. As I mentioned, we, we do uh, now measure chloride more commonly in our VLAP lakes. And there are um, about 80 lakes or so that we have enough data over about a 10 year period from 2010 to 2020 of measuring chloride concentrations. And what we found is a significantly increasing trend in chloride as well. So in about 60 out of the 80 lakes that we have 10 or more years worth of data, 60 out of the 80 were increasing. And on average, those chloride concentrations have increased by 20 or 71%. And the other, and this line right here is the uh, sort of the upper 75th percentile. So um, even at high levels, our chloride concentrations of about 45 are still way below that 230, but um, they are going up quite dramatically. And, uh, and that's 
that's not good. We also have a lot of data on our rivers, as I mentioned. And here we have uh, data presented from our river trend monitoring network. And these are the 40 stations that we measure on our river trend monitoring network along the X axis and their specific inductance on the Y axis. And the, the bars here are sort of arrayed in a fashion so that the uh, higher median specific inductance over the time period of 2012 to 2016 increases from lowest to highest. And the uh, this little stipple area in the background is the, the range of data for the statewide data that we have. And then the black line is, is the median for the state. But as you can see, um, as we go along this gradient here, the, uh, the black bars are those uh, watersheds in the sites that we monitor that have the highest level of development. So what that's telling us is basically the areas that have more pavement where more road salt is applied are becoming or have higher specific inductance readings. And I'm sure Steve will talk about this a little bit later. So um, one thing I was asked to talk about is some thoughts about how climate change might impact our use of salt and uh, potential outcomes. So here's, here's some thoughts. Uh, projections for climate change are basically temperatures would be increasing year round. I think everybody pretty much accepts that. We also know that precipitation uh, is likely to increase both in frequency and severity, especially during our winter and spring months. That coincides with our salt use, not surprisingly. And what we've seen, at least over the last couple summers and fall seasons, is that drought can uh, be pretty severe. So what does that mean for potential salt related outcomes? Um, if we have this increased precipitation in the winter time, we're likely to have more winter storm events. And those are likely to occur in warmer um, times when salt will be used more. I told you I was gonna come back to that a little bit and the effectiveness of salt at warmer temperatures. So it's still gonna be winter, but winter is gonna be warmer and we're gonna have more winter storm events. So it's likely that more salt would be used. Also, we know that, uh, as I talked about, this chloride is a conservative ion. So it tends to uh, build up in our groundwater. So after uh, it runs off, it soaks into the ground, it builds up in our groundwater supplies. So what's gonna happen when we have uh, more high precipitation events, this is likely gonna flush chloride out of our groundwater and into our surface waters. So we're gonna get more salt export from our groundwaters. And then also, because we know that salt is gonna be stored in our groundwater, if we have these periods of uh, drought, um, it's likely that that, that groundwater is gonna, is gonna become saltier and during those drought periods, most of the water that's in our streams and our lakes comes from groundwater. So the sources of water become almost primarily or almost exclusively groundwater. So the water that's entering into those surface water sources are gonna be saltier. So there's just some hypotheses. And there was a study done in 2017 on a uh, Hudson River tributary or a tributary to the Hudson River and its watershed. And basically they found exactly that peak chloride concentrations occur during winter precipitation events. They also found that most of the chloride load when they looked at it over, a, over an annual basis, 80% of it came from base flow of the streams, meaning it came from groundwater. And that chloride concentrations, and we see this here in New Hampshire all the time, you would think they would become highest in our streams in the winter time during salt use time. That's actually not the case. What we see is the highest chloride and highest specific inductance um, in our streams during summer uh, base flow periods when, um, when we don't have a lot of rainfall to dilute things. So those are just some quick predictions, um, whether they're come to fruition or not, we don't know, but uh, it seems likely based on this one study. So with that, that's the science part, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my 
screen, turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Steve Landry, who has a whole bunch of management options that will help us and help everybody else use less salt. So Steve, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, Dave, stop sharing that gloomy news with us, will you? <laughs> Gosh. And I, and you stop sharing, right? So I can go right ahead, Aaron. I, Is that I, right? I think so. Okay. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Anything uh, popping up there? Yep, I can see your presentation. I think you just need to get into um, full screen, right? Yeah, if you go to slideshow, you should be able. Oh, thanks. Yep, yeah. from beginning there. Well, uh, we didn't want to go from the beginning because we're sharing. Dave and I are sharing. It. Oh, sorry. That's OK. Uh, maybe I can just everybody shut your eyes. I'm going to fast forward. <laughs> do, 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 do. There we go. Yay. Thanks for your tolerating that. I hope no one got motion sickness there. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, co-present with uh, Dave Niels. Uh, he is definitely the, the science guy in this, uh, this pairing tonight. Um, and I, uh, I'm excited to uh, participate in the New Hampshire Lakes Association webinar this evening. Um, mucho respect for uh, New Hampshire Lakes and all the great work they do around the state. And um, what I wanna focus on tonight is uh, letting you know that all hope is not lost. Uh, obviously the data that we generate at DES oftentimes uh, can be a little bit uh, gloomy because we're seeing these negative trends in chlorides and surface waters. As Dave pointed out, it's really hard to do, it's, it's hard to do anything about chlorides once it's in the water supply, groundwater, surface water. There's not a filter that we can use. There's not a best management practice that we can use to get salt out. So once it's in, it's in, and Dave explained those biological uh, ramifications of that. One of the best management practices we have in our arsenal is to use less salt. That's really the biggest thing we can do right now is to use less salt. And that's what I want to focus on tonight and introduce you to uh, the salt reduction program at DES and our Green Snow Pro program. And those of us involved with the salt reduction program like to like to tell people that the, the road to salt reduction in New Hampshire was paved with eight lanes, ironically. The uh, I-93 widening project down in Wyndham basically triggered us to do a lot of science, work with DOT and other partners to determine how much salt was being contributed to the environment, especially the aquatic environment down in that urban corridor because we had several water bodies, namely small tributaries and a couple of lakes and ponds that were already kind of tipping the scale with high chlorides. And for DOT to widen 993, they had to find a way not to contribute more pollutants to waters that were already polluted or contaminated by chlorides. Kind of a tough call. And DOT was really the bullseye for that effort. Um, and we'll talk about why that was a little bit mistargeted uh, after we did a bunch of uh, research down there. Uh, for reference in New Hampshire, it's important to know that our constituents that participate in the salt reduction program and green snow pro program, they likely have plows on their vehicles seven months of the year in New Hampshire. That is a, a reality. So you need to think of that, you know, why are we using so much salt? Well, we can get snow seven months out of the year in the state. And you have to think of the state as a whole, you know, Southern New Hampshire might not see snow after a certain date, but up North, they're still laying salt down when we're down here out in our lawn chairs, catching a sun bath. Uh, they landscape five months out of the year. Um, so it's an interesting balance that we've uh, come to respect and, and work with in the uh, salt reduction community. Why are we using salt in New Hampshire? And Dave touched on this. What's our economy based around? Tourism. Uh, we also have basic needs for getting emergency vehicles safely to their destinations when needed. We also need to get to and from work safely and effectively all, all year round. And then we also have a lot of wants and needs as a society. And that's kind of the balancing point where um, 
we find a lot of uh, salt use is uh, laid down in New Hampshire, perhaps for things that we don't truly need. Um, for instance, do you need to wake up at 2 a.m. and go to Want Mart to get some kind of trivial thing for your shelf? Probably not, but people expect to do that 24 hours a day, no matter what the weather. And places like Walmart or other retail establishments pay com commercial salt applicators a lot of money to keep things safe. That results in a lot of salt being applied unnecessarily, and people freak out not because they see too much salt, but they freak out if they can't see salt visibly on the ground. People think it's unsafe to walk or drive if they can't see physical chunks of salt on the ground. They, they wanna hear it crunching under their feet because it makes them feel safe. But if you see rock salt, it's not working. As Dave pointed out, salt is most effective when it's in a solution, when it's in a brine that's when it's doing its work because it's melting ice. This rock salt you see here is doing absolutely nothing. Another, another point to keep in mind, if you see rock salt, it's not doing anything for you. And we freak out as biologists and environmentalists because we know this rock salt is doing nothing except running off in the next rainstorm into our surface water. So there's two levels of freaking out around salt application in New Hampshire. But people are going to steep keep coming to New Hampshire in all conditions because they want to go skiing and they want to get to the outlet malls. They want to come to our liquor stores and buy lottery tickets. God knows what, but the, the highways are packed going north on Fridays and south on Sundays. So we have to get people in and out safely. Uh, so we're going to continue to use rock salt. And in New Hampshire, I think Dave touched on this earlier, uh, we apply roughly 400,000 tons of salt every year in New Hampshire. That is a, I was gonna say it's a ton of salt, but that sounds really cliche at the moment, but it's a lot of salt being applied on our roads, on our parking lots, on our sidewalks. Um, and that's why we're seeing those negative trends in chlorides that Dave uh, walked us through. The problem is the overuse of salt in New Hampshire. And that's what we're trying to get our, our heads wrapped around. Uh, we use probably between 30, 50% more salt than, than is needed uh, to protect public safe, safety. And we need to put down, essentially learn to put down the right amount of salt, the right places and under the right conditions. And also at the right time, Dave had that slide about pavement temperature, air temperature, uh, people need to learn that. And ironically, Dave, you should recognize this photo because this looks out our window at DES at the parking lot. Uh, so the, the case of oversalting is always under our nose and just outside our window at DES, uh, sadly. Now, I think I showed you that picture a moment ago, big orange trucks being loaded with salt in a haphazard manner. So a lot of people point the finger at DOT. You know, they're always out plowing the highways, um, keeping us safe on 89, 93 and all the other roads they manage. However, DOT really has done an excellent job of reducing their salt use um, since the early 2000s. They have phenomenal trucks with GPS led track routes. They don't overlap routes. They work in tandem. They also do a ton of brine, so they're not using rock salt that bounces and scatters off the roads. They're doing a really, really good job. So DOT, kudos to you. Municipalities, same deal, especially in that I-93 corridor. They have reduced their salt usage tremendously since that I-93 widening corridor project went through. They, they followed suit with DOT and said, hey, we're, we can reduce salt use. We're going to convert our fleets to brine they're doing a great job at that reduction. That's the kind of trend we want to see in salt use. I wish it was the same trend for chlorides and, and lakes, but uh, DOT, municipalities, they're getting on board with this and doing what they can. So what about commercial and private sector salt use? A lot of people don't realize, you know, when they see big orange trucks, they're kind of an easy target. You see them spreading salt, but where do you, where do you go and see the most salt use? All of New Hampshire parking lots, huge, huge retail center parking lots, hospitals, commercial centers, airport runways. It's the commercial and private sector salt use that we really need to target in New Hampshire. And that's where the Green Snow Pro program came into effect in 2010, which was we need to focus on the commercial sector because they're hired by uh, retail establishments, condo associations, hospitals, uh, airports, you name it. They're out there spreading salt 
uh, we need to work on them and have them follow the same salt reduction trends as DOT and municipalities. This is a voluntary program for commercial salt applicators. Uh, it emerged out of that I-93 widening uh, project, like I mentioned. We need large chloride reductions in New Hampshire, and we determined that private and commercial salt application are the largest sources of chlorides in New Hampshire. And if you don't believe me, here's the pie chart to prove it. Um, take a look at um, state roads, 9% of the sources of chlorides in New Hampshire municipalities about 27 percent but our parking lots 50 percent of the uh, salt contamination or salt I should say salt applied in New Hampshire a couple other interesting nuggets for resident residential people um, we have um, water softeners as a source of chlorides uh, and also salt piles that are mismanaged contribute a little bit of salt into the environment as well but it's these parking lots and um, Municipal roads, again, but DOT is kind of off the hook in my book. But uh, so we wanted to focus on the commercial sector and target those parking lots and sidewalks. Commercial salt applicators, as you can imagine, though, are concerned about not only your safety, but they're also very concerned about getting sued. Um, if you look in a, if anybody remembers or is old enough to remember what a phone book is, if you went into the yellow pages, there's a section about this big for um, injury injury lawyer firms. It's a fat section, big billboards, you know, injury slip and fall cases. So these private commercial salt applicators are very concerned about slip and fall cases that are leveraged against them each winter. Along with creating the Green Snow Pro program and statute, we also did a side bar to that, which is in rule, which is we have a law that provides limited liability relief for commercial salt applicators if they participate in our Green Snow Pro program. And that means, and, and we took that language directly from the ski industry because, you know, when you go skiing and you sign a, a waiver, you're basically saying, yeah, I know skiing on sheets of ice on cannon is probably really stupid and dangerous, but I'm going to do it anyway. So this says, hey, if you're out driving or walking in icy conditions and a green snow pro salt applicator tried to make it as safe as you can for you applying the right salt at the right time, they should not be held liable for you going to Walmart at 2 a.m. to get a, you know, a toaster cover or whatever you do there. Um, so limited liability relief really, really depends on them being Green Snow Pro certified. It applies to the contractors, their clients, and the property owners that hire them. So it's a nice umbrella limited liability relief package that uh, makes them have a lot more confidence going out and applying the right amount of salt. Commercial applicators tell me all the time, Hey, I went and I brined a driveway of the hotel I manage for this for you know Red Roof Inn. They called me back because they couldn't see salt, so they went out and applied brine in a very small volume, far less than they would have with rock salt. But the people called and complained, "We can't see rock salt; it's not safe." So a lot of times they'll go back and throw rock salt down because they're going to lose their contract. So we not only have to educate salt applicators, but the people who hire them because they freak out if they can't see rock salt. The certification program for Green Snow Pro, Snow Pro has two, two tracks. You have to get trained. So anybody who wants to apply to us to get a Green Snow Pro certificate, they have to take a full course, pass an exam, and then they can apply to be a master individual subordinate salt applicator in Green Snow Pro. I took the, I took the full course and exam and I got a hundred and I've never driven a plow. So as long as you pay attention and pay attention on the course, uh, people can pass it. It's a, it, it's a pretty robust course. It's like a five hour course, but you can pass the exam if you pay attention. Uh, once they pass the course and exam, they can apply to DES for certification and they pay to get a certificate. So they've got skin in the game and it makes them be a little bit more responsible. They have to renew every year. Every time someone gets certified in the summer or fall, their certificate expires in June of the following year. So they have to pay attention and keep up with us and Get, uh, get renewed every year. They have to report their annual salt usage well in tons, and we want to track it by each community in New Hampshire. They also track their salt use by storm. And what, what if they get out of is that limited liability protection. They also save money because they're using less salt. And many, many commercial applicators that we work with now are sent, they're calling us uh, a lot this time of year saying, hey, I need to get Green Snow Pro certified because this client wants me to be Green Snow Pro certified. They won't hire me unless I have my certificate or 
I'm responding to a bid for snow maintenance, but everyone has to be Green Snow Pro certified to submit a bid. So word is getting out and it's really encouraging. And now even insurance carriers will only insure salt applicators if they hold a current Green Snow Pro certificate. So it's pretty exciting, it's getting out there. Um, as I said, there's two tracks, there's training, and then there's getting certified. Um, we have great, great training partners, UNH um, Technology Transfer Center, UNHT2. Uh, they are phenomenal to work with. We work with the Smart About Salt Council out of Canada. Um, and we also work with the uh, Snow and Ice Management Association, a national nonprofit dedicated to snow and ice management throughout the country. These are our authorized providers and partners. They are recognized by the program to be certified to provide trainings. We have a lot of information on our website, uh, application forms, SALT reporting. There's a UNH SALT reporting database. Uh, but if you remember, we're talking about commercial applicators, and some of them aren't technically savvy. Some don't own laptop computers. So most of this Green Snow Pro program traffics old school and hard copy papers. So it's a lot of paper processing because that's, that's what a lot of people can deal with. Um, so we have to be very dynamic and meet their needs. Uh, to date, 1,700 certificates have been issued for Green Snow Pro salt applicators. That's individual certificates. Uh, the number of businesses is uh, literally in the hundreds right now. The encouraging news is that uh, just this past summer, Senate Bill 131 passed. That is going to allow municipalities to participate voluntarily in this program going forward. So now we're capturing both of those bigger sectors, commercial, private, and now municipalities. So we're very excited about that. Uh, now we have to do the unsavory task of writing the rules um, now that we have the enabling legislation. But municipalities are literally calling us wanting to get involved. So that's a good sign. What can we do? And I mean, we on this call as individual homeowners that live on or near surface waters. Um, one thing you can do is if, if you're a homeowner group or a lake association group, you can look at online and see who's certified to be green snow pro. Uh, we, we update this every week. We expect to have probably over 600 certified uh, individuals on this list by the next couple of weeks. So if you're hiring as a condo association or a, 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 lake, a lake group, uh, you hire contractors, make sure they're green snow pro. You can also take some steps yourself. You know, Try to stop using rock salt and uh, try to explore using a brine or a liquid de-icer instead of something solid because you know if it's in a liquid, it's already starting to work. Uh, a lot of options out there. You can go to Agway and buy a, a sprayer. You can buy brine pre-made and apply it before a storm, and that will not allow ice to form or snow to adhere to surfaces. And um, there's also a lot of firms out there that you can contact. I'm trying not to promote anybody in particular, but I had to grab some phone number. But there's some great people out there, especially at De-Icing Depot. These guys know their stuff and are willing to talk to you and even do demos. So uh, give us a call if you're interested in doing any of that. Is Snow Pro working? Yeah, we've had uh, commercial applicators tell us after two years in the program, they had reduced their salt use by 45%. And then another guy just yesterday said, I, I am so glad I got involved last year. He's like, last winter, I cut my operating budget by 30% and that allowed me to buy a new truck with a brine sprayer. So they're slowly seeing economic benefits as well as salt application reductions. And that's, that's what we want to see is the economic benefits and also environmental benefits. So you're darn right it's working, working and we're darn proud of it. And um, we're going forward into a, into a winter season now and looking forward to bringing new people on board. New green snow applications come in daily to DES. So uh, it's a pretty exciting time. And David, I don't know if you wanted to hit these two summary slides and I'll hit the last two because this is up your alley right here. Yeah, you, I'll, I'll do these and you can, I'll just say uh, forward, you can do it. Hey. Thanks, Steve. So uh, just, just reckoning back to uh, things that I spoke about earlier, the, the trends that we had in, in chloride, we've documented throughout the state from the uh, VLAP data chloride is, is increasing pretty much everywhere we look. Um, and 60 out of the 80 water bodies that we have data from uh, over a 10-year time period have shown significant trends in chloride. Uh, that's the plot on the left there that Steve has. 
Um, the plot on the right is just uh, a, a reminder again that specific conductance is a very easy, quick and easy water quality measure. And anybody that does any volunteer monitoring you've done specific conductance measures, that's a, a, a simple, easy surrogate measure for chloride concentration. And what we know is that about 835 microns per centimeter, those are the units for specific conductance, uh, is equivalent to about 230 milligrams per liter of chloride. That's our chronic uh, water quality threshold. We don't have a lot of water bodies, thankfully, that are over that, that threshold, um, but we do have a couple, actually. So, next thing. Uh, the other thing that we know based on uh, our water quality data is that the more uh, development you have in a particular watershed, the higher the specific conductance tends to be. So the more roads, the more parking lots, as Steve pointed out, um, that you have, the more salt that gets applied, and that ends up as a conservative ion in our waterways. Next slide. And that's yeah, you. that's you. Thanks, David. Yeah, and I uh, just wanted to summarize real quickly that you know, if you want evidence that uh, we apply a lot of salt in New Hampshire, you can swing through Portsmouth and see Mount Saltmore there, the twin piles on the Piscataqua. A uh, lovely, lovely thing to walk by when you're visiting Portsmouth. Just go marvel at the sheer tonnage of salt that's getting prepped for oncoming winter. Um, and then also just, again, to stress, you just have to apply the right amount of salt, the right type. Typically, we want everybody to trend toward using liquids and brine because that salt is working. And make sure we're using it at the right temperature. It's air temperature and pavement temperature. So people are starting to get really, really uh, geared up. A lot of plow trucks now have ground temperature sensors so they know how much to apply and what concentration of brine they need to lay down. We also have to, to change people's expectations of what safe looks like. Like I said, you know, this looks safe, but it's just awful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can, it's, I think it's unsafe because I literally rolled my ankle on, the, on some of this stuff going into work one day. This is another picture of our DES parking lot, by the way, just for irony. Um, so we need to work on those behavioral changes for people who hire contractors as well. And that is a monumental task that uh, we're going to lay on the shoulders of our newly hired uh, salt reduction program coordinator, Aubrey uh, Volker, who has uh, joined us tonight for this webinar. So I'm hoping she's shaking in her boots right now, but uh, good luck with that, Aubrey. And uh, I'll end it right there and we can open it up for discussion. Okay, great. Thank you both. That was a lot of information, but you made it easy to understand and left us with some encouraging information. So thank you very much. Um, I will throw it to Michelle if you have the first question here, and then we'll just go down the list and see if we can get to everybody. Sure. Uh, thanks, both of you. Um, our first question was for Dave. Um, what is the highest conductivity or chloride value that you've seen in New Hampshire, and where did it come from? Oh, that's a... <laughs> It's a tough question. I wonder who posed that question. Um, I think that, you know, the highest I've probably seen is on the probably the five to 600 uh, micro Siemens per centimeter range. Um, somewhere down, I'm going to say uh, maybe Beaver Brook down in the dairy area. But I know one of those. Um, on the plot that I showed from the river trend monitoring sites that we have, one of the tributaries that we measure regularly um, is Hodgson Brook out on the uh, out on the seacoast that runs through Portsmouth, and that is around 1,100, uh, and that does typically violate the uh, the wa the chronic water quality criteria for chloride. So that that's a bad one. All right, you did answer this, um, but I'm gonna bring it up again anyway. Dan asked, can municipalities train for Green Snow Pro certification, which we know they will be able to do soon. So I'm gonna ask a follow-up question to this. And when do you think that will um, start happening? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, I, I'm, glad it, I'm glad it was asked again, because it made me realize that I, well, I, you know, I, I could talk all day about salt and Green Snow Pro, but 
several municipalities in New Hampshire are regulated under the MS4 phase two permit. Uh, it's about 50 communities and all those communities are required under the permit to uh, address salt use in their communities, especially if they have chloride impaired waters in those MS4 communities. And those communities are typically in the south, southeastern portion of New Hampshire where we have the most development and a lot of chloride impairments. Um, so I wanted to mention that like, they, are, they are already uh, addressing that. The other thing we're seeing with municipalities is um, when we started the program, the rules, the rules were specifically written for commercial uh, applicators, but many, many municipalities came anyway. And they said, well, we know we can't officially get certified, but we want our crews to do whatever they can to reduce salt use because it saves us money. <laughs> you know, they might not have been it for the environmental benefits, but they wanted to save money and get into brine. And um, so we, we have municipalities eager to wait. And uh, just last week, I saw some Green Snow Pro course results. And there was a slew of people from the Bow Department of Public Works, Portsmouth, Dover, Exeter. A lot of communities are just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, however, uh, once we get the rules written, they'll be in officially and can apply to us to get certified you know, under the rule. When that'll happen, I'd like to say as soon as possible, but the rulemaking process in New Hampshire is, is kind of like plate tectonics and glacial geology. It might take a little time. Uh, and especially where our program, the salt reduction program is managed solely by a, a, a part-time staff person. So we're, we'll do our best. I would hope that we'd be writing things, uh, writing rules this summer though is, is the best guess. That's awesome. Uh, our next question is what fraction of the 400,000 tons of salt applied annually is being applied by Green Snow Pro certified applicators? Oh, this is like the conductivity question for Dave. I, I <laughs> this one, an, an excellent question. I don't have the answer because um, we, uh, we are currently, ironically, November 1st was the deadline for commercial applicators to, to hit the late filing deadline. And these are mostly landscaping people, so they don't have a down season. You know, they're, they're doing spring, summer, fall landscaping, and then they try to get certified for the coming season now. Like last week was utter chaos. So part of that process, though, is they have to report their salt use from last winter to us. So we're still getting stuff in paper in a reported UNH database. So I, I have no idea right now, but that is an excellent question that we should be able to quantify in a couple months once everybody's gotten all their information in and we've issued the six or 700 applications we need to. Good question, thank you for that. Okay, here's another interesting one. How do you stockpile brine? <laughs> The short answer is very, very carefully. Uh, the real answer is there's a variety of mechanisms to store brine. Um, this is one of the barriers to, to municipal or commercial fleets switching over to brine is A, you have to make brine, usually on site, have big polyethylene tanks on site with spill protection around them. Um, and preferably inside. Some, you can do it outside if you have proper containment because they're closed storage uh, devices. Or you can have brine uh, delivered to you on site through liquid tanker trucks, uh, but that's, that's a pretty pricely, pricey uh, way to go about it. So you're either storing it on site, you're either making it in or on the truck itself, or a lot of commercial applicators have tow behind trailers with brine making and distribution units right on the trailer. So there's a variety of ways, a variety of ways to uh, store it. And one thing we're working with, with uh, the, the gentleman I mentioned from de-icing depot, he's, he's super into brine making and storage right now. And he's working with rail car uh, personnel to use inert or inactive tanker cars on rail to be brine hub stations. So commercial applicators and municipal applicators wouldn't have to store it on their own properties. They could come and get it, unload it onto their rigs and drive to where they need it. So uh, 
it, it's a big mix, but that's that's kind of where we're at with storage. Great. Um, I'm going to combine, maybe in the interest of time, two questions. Um, questions about what do you think of using kitty litter or pet safe de-icers for homeowners? Are they safe alternatives as long as they don't have chloride? Um, and then and then any comments in regards to sand salt mixes or calcium chloride as a home de-icer versus sodium chloride? Is that too many? <laughs> no, that's that's a loaded question. Certainly something for for a deeper discussion. And I think uh, when you're talking about those products, you know, are you are you looking to get traction or are you looking to melt ice? Um, and that that's kind of how I would make those decisions decisions about kitty litter or alternative de-icing materials. And you know, there's there's programs out there using beet juice as a de-icer. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of non-chloride specific, uh, de-icing products out there. People are using like, um, brew manufacturing yeast leftover materials. There's all sorts of stuff out there. So I don't, I can't say I have an opinion over it, but I would say if you want to have a further discussion about it, you can contact me at DES. And in the future, what I want to have is a forum with someone from the de-icing depot about this very subject. Uh, they're, they're expert on this and can tell you about the, the pros and cons about uh, sand, salt mix, pre-wetting salt, pre-wetting sand, uh, alternative, alternative de-icers. So if you're interested, uh, let, let me know and we'll, uh, we'll try to set something up. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you tonight. Okay, we do have a few minutes left and it looks like we just have one um, last question in here uh, that we'll probably be able to get to this evening is what is the S unit in the micros per centimeter measurement that you speak of, which I'm not sure exactly what that was in re reference to, but if it rings a bell for either of you, please let us know. It's right up your alley, Steve, right? Uh, the, the, the S stands for Siemens, so micro Siemens per centimeter is the, the unit of measure for uh, specific inductance. Sometimes it's also uh, micro Mohs, which is the, uh, the reverse of ohms. It's, it's, a, it's an electrical conductance thing. So the, those two are interchangeable. So Siemens. There we go. Now we know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for this evening. I don't have any other questions for you guys, but I just want to thank you once again. That was a lot of really good information and again, hopeful improvements that we're making. And um, I hope you both have a great night and thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. As I mentioned before, this will be on our website um, tomorrow morning. You'll get an email if you participated or if you registered and you can go there anytime and view it if you want to share it with friends or family or colleagues. So we'll say good night now. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.